All right. I think one of the things that pastors often do well is uh, to tell people why this is exciting, why we're all glad to be here. And uh, I'd like to apologize ahead of time. I think today's message is going to be kind of boring and, and very lengthy. <laughs> it, I can't believe we did this on the Packer Bear Day, but add that to choir practice, and I'm really regretting I didn't DVR the game because I think we're in trouble. But I've got, all year I look forward to the Packer Bear game, and then here we are. What time is it anyways? Right now, I mean. Uh, 23? Well, I promise we'll finish before the evening service. Luke chapter 8. So I was going over my message last night. And thought, wow, this is kind of boring. We'll see. I doubt it. I wanted to change it last night and it didn't happen. So. Did anybody here actually like school? Yeah, nice, nice. I like that. Uh, who is, just real quick, real quick, favorite teacher? What did she teach? Cool. Somebody else? Your mom, nice. Somebody else? Mom and dad. Somebody else? What? Oh, nice, nice, nice. I like it. Okay, what he teach? Nice. Good. Great. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, last week, we saw that uh, Jesus did something none of our favorite teachers did. Uh, he commanded the winds and the waves to stop their commotion. Uh, I think a lot of teachers nowadays have enough time trying to stop the children's commotion. Uh, I, s I was teaching in Japan and saw a gal teacher came running out of her roaming tears because she could not quiet those kids. They were, they were horrible. Uh, I got control of my class by taking the biggest guy in class who was the noisiest, grabbing his bag and throwing it out the door, telling him to go get it and then closing the door behind him. But <laughs> But it was a, sometimes kids are really rough, aren't they? Uh, but Jesus is not simply a good teacher. I, I, that was really cool. We had a lot of people who liked biology in here. Uh, Jesus is, is not simply a, good, a great biology teacher, a great math teacher, or even a great moral teacher. Jesus is so much more than that. Jesus, we saw last week, this is the big difference. He's not just an historical figure who taught wonderful things. He commanded the wind and the waves to stop their commotion, and they stopped. That makes Jesus very unusual. That makes him unique. Uh, have you ever seen, either in person or maybe on YouTube, waves just crashing onto rocks or are on television for a nature documentary or, or a lighthouse that's kind of out in a peninsula and the waves just crashing all around it and the, the seas are all churned up and the, you see the boats going up and down and Jesus says settle down and the seas settle down the winds are just ripping through there and blowing they're afraid it's going to toss their boat over settle down and the, the winds just die down the disciples even though they had been with Jesus and seen miracles they were scared, and they said, what sort of man is this? I think that's a pretty honest, pretty good response. They knew Jesus was a big deal. They had no idea at this point. What sort of man is this? Scary. We're going to continue to answer that question today. Uh, Jesus is not simply a good teacher. Last week, we saw that Jesus says a word, an untamed nature is tamed. Uh, today we're going to see Jesus has complete authority over demonic forces. Uh, Hollywood likes to make movies about uh, monsters and, and demons, and, and 
There's a lot of people that are tormented psychologically, and, and there's a lot of darkness. We see, also see that Jesus has complete authority over sickness and even death itself. Who can do these things? Who has authority over demonic forces, over sickness, over death? Well, here's a hint. Not Bev, your favorite teacher. Uh, nobody can do these things except God alone, right? Uh, very glad you're here, sister. Uh, C.S. Lewis quote. Uh, I am, C.S. Lewis wrote, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing. Because people say foolish things, amen? amen? I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus, about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say, C.S. Lewis says. A man who is merely a man and who said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. The things Jesus said would not make him a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make the choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for being a fool. You can spit on him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. We saw in Mark, and we're going to see here again in Luke in a few more chapters, not today, that a man calls Jesus a good teacher. And Jesus tells him, why are you calling me good? You know only God's good. Isn't that a funny response? Good teacher. Why are you calling me good? Only God is good. L uh, yesterday I was with Chet and Rachel. We got free tickets to go to the Badger game. Uh, the weather was perfect. It was with wonderful company. My sister and my brother-in-law Chet. Great time. Uh, the Badgers didn't quite score enough. It was 58 to 0. I could have I seen some more scoring, to tell you the truth. But I don't want to quibble. Don't want to complain too much. But it, this week was also the anniversary of 9-11. Of and uh, sometimes when we're here at church and we love each other and we're having a good time and we love to eat together here at this church and we're always laughing. One of the, listen, I love you guys. When the worship team is ready to start worship, the meet and greet has to stop. But you know what? That's a good problem to have. I would not, I'm not encouraging it. But we love each other in this church, and, and when there's new folks here, we, we get all around them and, and want to talk to them. But, but uh, life is not always easy, and it's not always good. In fact, a lot of us are here, right? And the smile's not fake. We don't believe in putting on a fake smile for church, but, but underneath the smile, there's pain, right? There's fears, there's worries, there's health issues, there's financial issues, and man, they haven't gone away for a few years. I don't see the end of the, you know, there's stuff. There's always something going on. And then there's days like 9-11, or there's days that you go to the doctor, and he tells you what he didn't want to say, even though he's done it so many times before, and what you don't want to hear and what you know is going to devastate your loved ones. And that's, you know, very few of us go out easy. We all tend to go out messy. <laughs> I look up at the universe, and I see a giant universe. We've got our own uh, solar system, which is so huge, it just takes years and years and years for us to send a spaceship from Earth to the, to the outer reaches of it. And, and our solar system is just, one little tiny solar system. Each one of those dots in the nighttime sky is a sun just like ours. And in our part of this part of the universe is called the Milky Way. And, you know, there's 100 billion stars in it. 100 billion, approximately. 
each one a solar system with little hunks of rock going around it. Of course, space is mostly empty space. That's why it's called space, right? Uh, and you, you've got, it takes so long, it takes light ages to move from one star to another star. So long to move across our huge Milky Way. You know what? Our Milky Way is just a medium-sized galaxy. I said there's 100 billion stars in the Milky Way. Well, there's probably 100 billion galaxies out there. Some of them much bigger than the Milky Way. And a lot of scientists think that at the middle of our galaxy, there's a massive black hole. And this black hole, if a black hole is something that's so powerful, it has so much gravity that even light can't escape. Light is pulled in. That's why it's black. Nothing comes out of it. And we worship a God who's got all of it in the palm of his hand. Who knows each star. He's got a name for each star. And he knows how many hairs you have on the top of your head before and after you comb. And he can hear the prayers of everyone simultaneously. And if there's people or something like people on some other place, he hears all their prayers too. We'll find out when we get to heaven. Massive God. Well, I know God's powerful. Does God care? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Does God care? Or is he indifferent? Uh, when 9-11 hits, where's God? When, when I'm so afraid and nobody seems to care and my own friends aren't there, my family isn't there, does God care? When I'm looking at death, Find God's powerful. Does he care about me? And specifically, does he care about somebody so miserable and wretched and messed up as me? Could that be? Holy God, perfect God. And here I'm a, a wretch. Treated, treating people so poorly sometimes. And what goes on between the ears? Worse than what even comes out of the mouths, right? Could God love somebody like that? Could God care about me? When I think about D-Day, storming that beach, oh, Linda was with the not Vets Rolls, but Badger, what was that called? Badger Honor, Badger Honor Flight yesterday. She was in Washington, D.C. She went with the Vets yesterday. Wonderful thing. Uh, really honor and respect those fellas. Life can be pretty bad. And you know what? We have kids right here in Janesville who have taken their own lives because they couldn't take the cruelty of other kids. I got to know, with all this bad news, does God care? Is God good? Too much death, rape, and he's sitting there in heaven. He could stop it. Suffering, agonizing suffering, hunger. Who can sit by and watch somebody die of starvation? Cancer, who, le who would let that happen? If I could stop cancer, I would stop it in all of you in a heartbeat. I wouldn't want any of you to be sad, to go through want or need. I, as a parent, you, you wish you could always protect your kids. Well, God could. God could. God could stop rape. God could stop cancer. God could stop the hunger of children. He could. I want to know, does God care? Because if he doesn't care, I don't care how much we say we love him. He don't love us. We're all in trouble. I have a friend, some of you know him, Vance. Uh, I remember we were in high school. We are all sitting around the lunch table. Well, one, we are all sitting around the lunch table. In the middle of Parker High School's lunch, he stands up and says, I am scum, and these are my friends. But that's not the story I wanted to tell you. Uh, I, was, uh, I was one of those guys I brought my Bible to, to, to Parker all the time. Uh, I'd set it out on the table on the desk. 
as soon as I felt like I wanted to hide it, I put it on the outside of my other books I'm carrying because I knew that was good for me. And I wanted other people to see that church is not just a bunch of old people on Sunday, but there are actually people who believe. And, and people started coming to me and talking with me. And I, I, would, I remember one time praying at lunch, Lord, send me somebody to talk to at lunchtime about Jesus. I opened up my eyes and the guy's there, you're religious, right? I've got some questions. Sat down, started talking to me. And, and I was evangelizing one of my friends once, and I knew Vance is a Christian. I want his input. And I said, Vance, you believe, right? He said, I believe in God because I worship power, and he's the most powerful. Well, God is the most powerful, but does he care? And you know what? I did not get Vance's permission to put all this stuff on television. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This last week in a leadership discipleship group, we read through Psalm 144. And the psalmist asked the question, O oh Lord, what is humanity, what is man, that you would take knowledge of him, that you would acknowledge him, that you would notice him? Why would such a big, awesome God that has supernovas and, and all these pulsars, and, and, and from the massive right down to, to, to quarks and these minute particles and he's light a wave or a particle and all all of these things and God's aware of it all in his mind every single star every single particle all at one all at one moment so God is big God's powerful by definition but why would he even care about us what is this bit in in Genesis right at the beginning that God created us in his image and he actually wanted to communicate with us, to commune with us, that he came down in the cool of the day to, to walk with Adam and Eve. What is this all about? What is this when, when God is saying, Behold, I'm knocking at the door of your heart. Open up and I will come in and we will do life together. We will eat together. We will talk with one another. What is it about God? Why would God care about us? Aren't we like ants or, or little fleas on some mud ball through space and the cosmos doesn't care. The universe doesn't care. Some cosmic energy rolls through and our, our thin atmosphere above this little speck of light is gone and we're gone and nobody would ever know the human race was here or ever care. What does this deal with God? Because if God does love us, it, it makes something interesting about this big universe. It means all of it was created for love. It means love is at the core of everything. It means that God created you and I to have fellowship with him. And the, the beautiful picture, I think Keller, Pastor Keller out in New York, had the illustration of three chairs set up together, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And they're looking at one another. And they're enjoying each other. And they set another chair there and invite you, come on and sit down. And God invites us to enjoy the communion of the Trinity. He invites us to come and be loved and to love. I want to take a brief rabbit trail that's not as brief as it should be, but whatever will be, will be. Uh, about the problem of evil, you often hear the question, if God is all-powerful, then he can't be good. If he's good, then he must not be all-powerful. You understand that? If God were all-powerful, he could just stop all the pain and suffering, the rape and the hunger and all those things. So if he doesn't stop it and he's all-powerful, that means he's not good. Because a good person would stop those things. And if he's good and he wants to stop all those things but can't, it means that God's not all-powerful. Now, again, I'm not going to take too much time with this today, but I do want to point out that this is a very serious question that a lot of people have. And a lot of people have heard this on the Internet or something, and they're feeling pain in their life. You notice that a lot of people, their separation from God often starts because of suffering and pain, a feeling of loneliness, a feeling that like nobody understands. And so you're feeling, saying, why doesn't God do anything? Why did God let my dad die? Why did God let my, my dog die? Why, why, why did God let me get a heart trouble? You know, all of these different things, all these different questions, because a good person, if they love me, they wouldn't let these things happen to me. That's what we think is called the problem of evil. It's a serious question. It's an emotionally laden emotionally driven question uh, at its heart and, and it helps to understand this it's not a logical question this is something that people feel and there's a weight to it so it, sometimes you can say well check 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 I can answer that and that still doesn't answer somebody's heart to answer their feelings logically it's obvious that the question 
uh, has no meaning if there's no God, right? So let's say the universe is just some random chance. The universe is here. There is no God. It just happened. And now, well, the problem of, pay, well, well, what? Amoebas are dying all the time. Nobody cares. You know, I don't like to see possums and chipmunks and squirrels on the side of the road. Nobody likes that, raccoons, deer. But they're forgotten pretty quickly, aren't they? If there's no God, this idea that life should be fair and is an illusion, where, boosh, in the Big Bang and in the evolution of life after that, where do we get this idea of fairness? It just is. So you take away God, and there is no problem of evil. The problem of evil can only exist if there is a God. Then we say, there must be a God, and I don't understand this. So see, it's not a logical question, but it is a, it's a very emotional one. And, and, and we need to understand that people are feeling these things. Nature just is if there's no God. And nature is red in tooth and claw. And it's all about survival of the fittest. And there is no such thing as justice. Uh, there is no such thing as moral excellence. Uh, there is no such thing that to say, well, forgiveness is better than holding a grudge. And the tiger says, Rawr, it eats you. Like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It, and... And if you think that human values matter and they're transcendent, I want to ask you a question. If the human race were hit by an asteroid and wiped out, our values are done. <laughs> In other words, they don't extend. There's, there's no transcendency to them. They're just one culture feels something at one time, different generation, different part of the globe, different time, that culture feels something else. Uh, there is no such thing as good that we can aspire to that's higher and more noble than we are. We make our own rules for what's right and wrong. So there is no, there is no problem of evil. Obviously, obviously. Uh, life can be painful. Life can be unfortunate in the sense that you just got hit by a car. That's, gee, that's unfortunate. But there's nothing evil about it because evil can only exist if holiness and goodness exist first. Evil is a corruption of goodness just like a broken stick it can't exist unless it was a, a, a non-broken stick first. Uh, the, you cannot be a lie unless truth exists. This is how we know that, that goodness is superior to wickedness because wickedness is dependent upon goodness for its existence. As soon as there's goodness and as soon as there's free will, there's the possibility of evil. All these things make sense. All this is logical, but it doesn't answer the heart question. Does God actually care? Holiness, goodness, transcendent moral excellence. But does he care about me? Most people ignore this uh, and again, we talk about not only atheists and theists, but apatheists, right? The majority of Americans are apatheists. I, yeah, I believe there's a God, and I live my life as if he doesn't exist. I'm pretty apathetic about it, <laughs> apatheists. Most people ignore the problem of evil by kind of redefining evil, and evil ends up being the things that make them uncomfortable and thus unwelcome. But again, that renders the problem of evil meaningless because it's just what I like. I, I like... Uh, uh, don't ruin the brat by putting too much ketchup on it. Everybody knows brats need mustard. And you really shouldn't kill people or commit adultery because I don't like that. That's, and I like blue. Problem of evil is meaningless if there is no transcendent moral values. Uh, so the problem of evil is really an only interesting question if God exists. No God, no such thing as good and evil. It's all relative. Uh, secondly, the problem of evil is an equation... That can't be answered. You know, when you're in math class and you're trying to find out X and Y and triangle symbols that I've forgotten what they, whatever, I'm the wrong person to be giving this illustration. And, but you know, in order to find out the solution, you have to have enough of the variables. If you don't have enough of the variables, you cannot answer the equation. And we don't have, with our finite lives, let's just be honest and logical, without seeing eternity, without seeing heaven, we, the longest person lives 120. Most of us are going to kick off in our 70s and 80s. Uh, we don't have enough of the equation. We don't even understand our own lives, let alone other people's lives, let alone the universe, let alone eternity. So we don't have enough of the variables in the equation to answer it. The question, uh, the problem of evil, assumes several things that are impossible to assume. And you all know what happens when you assume something. Uh, number one, that suffering in this world is more profound than suffering in the next world, i.e. hell. If suffering in hell is more profound than suffering here, even 
high fact of it going on forever, even if hell is no different than Janesville, Wisconsin, but it goes on forever. Imagine trying to get along with people. Imagine with putting up with yourself for that long. Uh, in other words, if hell is, if suffering in hell is worse than suffering here, that kind of nullifies the problem of evil because the problem, the existence of evil may be something to stir me to avoid hell. You see how that followed? Evil here helps me to think, I don't want it in eternity. That suffering, number two, that suffering in this world is more profound than joy in heaven. We assume that a moment in heaven would not make suffering here on earth worthwhile. But that's an assumption we are not qualified to make. And thirdly, the question assumes that we can have such complete knowledge of the universe that we can be certain that God could not possibly have a purpose for allowing suffering. See how these, there's these huge assumptions. The problem of evil is not a logical question, but it's a very powerful question because of our human experience. Because, number one, if suffering in hell is worse than suffering here, and now, uh, and here and now, then suffering now can be used as a cautionary tale to avoid its continuance in eternity. Number two, and if the joy and grandeur of heaven is such that the moment we enter paradise, we will say, you know what, it was worth everything to... <laughs> to breathe in the fresh air of heaven and to feel all my sins being washed away, to know I no longer struggle with my selfishness, my hard-headedness, my orneriness, my heart, you know, all this, my hard heart, my selfishness, to have it all gone, to, have, to, to, to be able to look other people in the eye and they're not judging you, they're not being critical, and you're not doing that about them anymore because we're together and we're family and the Lord has brought us together because of his love. In the moment we enter paradise, we say, every single thing that happened to me was worth it all, then we'll join in the Apostle Paul who points out in Romans 8, 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Or in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for our light and momentary troubles. And Paul was shipwrecked and beaten, hit with stones till people thought he was dead, eventually gets his head cut off by this crazed emperor named Nero. And Paul says, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Paul, who met the resurrected Jesus Christ, believed that eternity outweighs the present. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. amen. And if it is even remotely possible that God has a plan for allowing bad things to happen, then we see that the problem of evil is not an intellectual problem and it's more than just an emotional response. It is an issue of trust, of faith. Can I trust that God is good and that he cares even when life is full of suffering and pain? Do I have faith in the character of God even when my life feels like a toilet bowl? Do I have faith in the character of God? And that's, when, that's why we put crosses up front. Not because we worship a piece of wood, but so we can remember what God did for messed up people like you and me. God sees the sin, he sees the death, he sees the sickness, he sees the pain, and he says, I'm going to do something about that, and he comes to take care of our problem for us because he loves us. Okay, let's read uh, out of Luke. And as we read, keep in mind the story of Jesus calming that storm because Jesus could, Jesus could have commanded a peaceful crossing before they even got in the boat, but he didn't. The disciples, if, if Jesus had just create a beautiful day, it would have been like every other peaceful day, every other beautiful day, the disciples would have never been seized by fear. They would have never said, wake up, don't you care that we're going to perish? And they would have never known who they had in the boat with them. I, I want to insult everybody in this room. <laughs> Again, <laughs> including myself. We are so thick-headed, slow-witted, and ornery that if God didn't stir the nest, we'd never learn how to fly like an eagle kicking its birds out of the nest. We, if this life, if, we had, if Adam and Eve and their descendants had been allowed to stay in paradise, we would have lived this eternity that was no longer paradise. It would be an eternal existence eating from the tree of life, far from love, far from joy, being bitter, embittered, fighting with moms and dads, fighting with husbands and wives, fighting against one another, just eternity just like Janesville but only forever, 
and we'd be separated from God. But God kicked us out of the garden so that we would find this compelling reason to find him, that we would reach out and find a God who is first reaching down to us. They would not have known who they had in the boat unless God had allowed the storm. So keep that in mind as we read. Okay, read, uh, we're going to read a passage now that I don't understand, but that's okay. I'm often up here preaching on things I don't understand. Okay, he, uh, Luke chapter 8. Twenty-six through thirty-nine. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. It was a Gentile region. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. Now, there's some talk whether there were two men here or whether this is a separate situation from the one we studied about uh, previously. Uh, I think there's probably two, but he's just addressing the main one now. But for a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but lived in the tombs. He's, this poor guy is messed up. Uh, he's a demon-possessed man. He, it's easy to look at this guy and be afraid. It's easy to look at this guy and be disdainful. But that's not the way Christ sees it. And I think we, our sympathy him should be stirred up in our hearts when he saw jesus he cried out and fell at his feet shouting at the top of his voice uh what do you want with me jesus son of the most high god i beg you don't torture me this is the demonic forces talking through him uh and when you hate god when you're fighting with god being close to jesus is always painful we don't want to be close to god because it's too painful For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot, he kept and kept under guard. And imagine that poor community. This guy's, um, and here's the thing that's interesting. He must not have been a rapist or a murderer, otherwise they would have put him to death. Uh, They were able to grab him and bind him and keep him under guard. He was always making trouble, maybe, I don't know, just always running through the streets, making trouble. Uh, they tried to bind him. They tried to keep him locked up, but he was, he was so crazed that he would, he would break free and, and escape. He would break the chains. And I don't know if it was like super strength or, or he, have you seen uh, videos of people who've been taking drugs and the police tase them and it has no effect? And the police often respond. It took five or six of us like they had superhuman strength. Well, the person's physically just as strong before, but they're broken mentally, and so they don't respond the same anymore. And, and I don't know if this fellow had extra strength or if he was just didn't care about the wounds on his hands from breaking things, but, but he was able to break free from every chain, and, and he was driven then by the demon into solitary, by the demon into solitary places. And that's interesting that the demon made trouble when he was in town, but the demon also took him out to a place of profound loneliness. Uh, because of the demonic influence, he didn't have community anymore. He didn't have fellowship. He was very much alone. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion. And this is scary, right? He replied, because many demons had gone into him. And a Roman legion would be five or 6,000. Uh, so I don't know if that, I, you see somebody say, so he had 6,000 demons. I don't, it could have been hyperbole. It could have been just a statement. He could have had 10,000. I don't know how many demons go you know who how many angels dance on the head of a pin who knows there's a lot of them here there's a lot of demons and so it's the bible says that they and they begged jesus repeatedly not to order them into the abyss and so now you see jesus who could command wind and waves to stop now there's this demon possessed man who's been so difficult to control and so miserable and he's at the feet of jesus christ and, and he's saying please don't torment uh, so these are the demons talking through him. And, and, uh, and they're begging Jesus. They're trying to negotiate with, Jesus, negotiate with Jesus. But it's not a negotiation where it's give and take. It's a negotiation, negotiation more like a robber who's been caught and he's holed up and he said, now if I come out, you won't shoot me, right? <laughs> I mean, there's, there's nothing. That it's, it's just how, in what manner are they going to surrender to the Lord? And they're, they're trying to uh, plead with him for some good terms. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. So the question I've always had 
is why did the demons want to go into pigs? And I've taught this passage several times, and I try to study from different pastors several times. And there's some theories out there that are very unmemorable because they're not very compelling. I don't know why demons think the way they do. And the Bible doesn't tell us. They are such wretched, miserable spirits creatures, these demons, that the biggest, the purpose for their life wasn't to love and to bless and be an encouragement. Their purpose was to make this fellow miserable. So they're not logical. They're not rational. And, and they say, well, at least send us into the pigs. And Jesus lets them. But as soon as they get into the pigs, the pigs go crazy. And the pigs go running down off of a cliff and into the water and all the pigs drown. And then what happens to demons? I don't know if they sit around in dead pigs or, or what. Uh, when the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake, and the, the pigs were drowned. Moving on. That was actually pretty good. That's the kind of joke I'm going to unfortunately remember and inflict upon the rest of you next time. Case of mass suicide. When those tending the pigs saw what happened, and by the way, those tending the pigs, they're probably Gentiles, right? Because the Jews weren't supposed to have pigs. So some people say these were, these were Jews who were living in a Gentile region, and so Jesus was taking the pigs away from them. But I think that's reading his text. It's a Gentile region. Most likely these are Gentiles. The interesting thing is they don't demand their money back. They're scared of Jesus. The demon, they were herding their pigs near the tombs. They, they knew that crazy guy was over there, but they must have had reason to have their pigs there but when jesus uh casts the demons out they're more terrified of jesus than they were of the crazy guy god is scary getting close to god is scary it always has been it always will be uh when those tending the pigs saw what had happened they ran off and reported this in the town in the countryside and you'd think great news the crazy man the guy who's been t uh, tormented by demonic forces he's even set free he's totally different but that's not the way it goes down and the people went to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out sitting at Jesus' feet in his, in his right mind. And they were afraid. I've read that passage at times in my life and wept when I came to that. Because you see so, so much craziness in my own life. And you see people struggling with so many different things. And here's somebody who encounters Jesus Christ. And now they've been set free. And they're in their right mind. Isn't that beautiful? How wonderful people can be when they get close to Jesus. How different our lives can be when we get close to Jesus. And it just moves me and it touches me. This, this man, this, this wonderful man who was tormented and who knows how he got in this mess in the first place, but he was full of these, this demonic influence. And here he comes close to Jesus and now he's in his right mind. He's rational. He's wonderful. But the people... Because of their wicked hearts, instead of rejoicing, they're just angry and upset with Jesus. Those who had been seeing it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were so overcome with fear. So they got into the boat and left. So he got in the boat and left. Brothers and sisters, if you see Jesus at work, if you see a God, you know it's a God thing. Don't leave. Don't leave. Run to Jesus. Get in your right mind. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him. Isn't this interesting? Let me go with you. He wants to share his testimony. He wants to be part of what Jesus is doing. But Jesus sent him away saying, I want you to go back to your home. And I want you to tell everyone what God has done for you. Isn't that beautiful? There's going to be some people who are traveling evangelists. There's going to be some people who are missionaries. But who, whether you're one of those folks or whether you're a plumber or a butcher or you work over at the, 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 the steak and shake or wherever you, you're at work, wherever you live, go tell people what God has done for you. Tell them that you were a wretch, that you were miserable, that you couldn't even stand yourself and you were forgiven. And you're forgiven completely. Let them know that that forgiveness is available for them as well. Wherever you're at, whatever your situation, go and tell people. 
Jesus sends this person back as a witness. Uh, probably he's a Gentile, sends him back to the other Gentiles as a witness. Return home, home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and he told all over town how much Jesus had done for them. Can you believe this guy who was naked and dirty and living in the wilderness? He was so much trouble, they always tried to lock him up. Now he's rational in his right mind, and he can't help but talk about Jesus Christ. He can't help but share with everyone around him the things that God has done for him. What a good God we have. What a wonderful God. I feel happy for this man. I feel sorry, and I want to be very careful here. Sympathy for the devil can be a dangerous thing because people start to empathize with the devil. People start to think almost like the devil is angry at God, and how dare he... And, we don't want to do that. We don't want to, when you start thinking like Satan, you're wrong. Uh, but I feel badly that God was before them, the Lord of love. In, they're incapable of feeling anything but fear, and they want to escape from him. And, and, and they had ruined this man's life, and that was like their high point of their, their existence was to be in him, ruining his life. And as soon as they get out, they bring death and destruction to the pigs. But this man is redeemed, he's saved from his situation, and now he can enjoy the Lord. Isn't that a better place to be? To be able to enjoy goodness? Here's goodness, and I don't want to run from it? I found some neat thoughts on the internet. Uh, one from a fellow named John Erickson, whose job description is a community manager at a company called Stack Exchange, which is a website where people go to ask questions and exchange answers on topics like physics, computer games, patents, and theology, among others. And it's related to the website Stack Overflow. I was wondering, Jerry or Aaron, you guys know that one? Uh, which serves the same question and function except for computer programmers. Uh, and the reason I went into all of this is, to, is because I think it's really cool that the person who gave me some of the most interesting uh, insights and questions, thought-provoking answers, has worked at a website company and not with pastor or seminary teacher. Uh, that's cool, isn't it? I mean, uh, here, are some, uh, here is some of what John at Stack Exchange had to say, some interesting points, and there was quite a few, but demons in the New Testament appear more often in Gentile areas, and when you're in Jerusalem, there's no stories of demonic possession. I thought that's interesting. And I, and I wonder about that, and I'm extrapolating here, and and I don't want to get too much into demonology because the Bible says little about demons because the Bible wants us to focus on Jesus. When you're focusing on Jesus, we don't have to worry about the demons. People say, but what should I do about the demons? Focus on Jesus, you know. Uh, but, but I wonder if you, in, in uh, areas where there's a lot of superstition, a lot of uh, people who, uh, did you know that people who, who uh, claim to uh, see UFOs and aliens also have a much higher percent chance of saying they've experienced uh, ghosts and supernatural forces. So there's something about this, this mindset that uh, opens ourselves up to these things, and missionaries in some places where Christianity is not strong. So I wonder, and as the United States becomes less and less God-centered and there's less and fewer in Christians, think about this. If a demon comes and starts to torment Christians who are loving Jesus, or, or, or in that time, you know, around Jewish people who are trying to uh, practice their faith in God. What, is that, what do they do right away? They start praying. So it's kind of, demons say, well, I don't want to encourage praying, so I don't uh, reveal myself so overtly in these areas. But in perhaps, and again, this is a, perhaps, uh, in Gentile areas where there's going to be no instinct to pray to the living God, they can torment and, and be more abusive and be more uh, obvious in, in what they do because there's not going to be a, a driving people to Christ kind of thing. Uh, secondly, the man may have been the one to run to Jesus, but it's the demons who take over the interaction. That's, uh, that's a guess. I think it's an interesting thought. Thirdly, Jesus could have cast out the demons in an unspectacular way, say, demons be gone. He didn't have to talk to them. He didn't have to do the whole show with the pigs. However, everyone would have always doubted this man had really changed. By having the demons talk and then having them go into the pigs and go down the cliff, even the people around him knew something big had happened. In this spectacular way, Jesus was having mercy on this man, uh, and it, it also helped him with his testimony. The Net Bible, uh, New English translation, but it's always being updated on the Internet, 
uh, also points out in one of his study notes that demons are destructive. Their influence was destroying the man, and when they entered the herd of pigs, they destroyed them as well. This is part of Christ's kindness to allow us, even today, we can see, well, I can't see demons, but I understand there's visible harm. They can harm us in ways, invisible spirits can harm us in very real ways. Invisible spirits can harm us in very real, real ways. And that's why the Bible tells us don't fool around with uh, trying to contact the dead, with witchcraft, all those things. Uh, there's a lot of superstition. There's a lot of game playing. But there is also opening ourselves up to demonic influence. And you just don't want to play games with it. Uh, why? We've got God and he loves us. And we've got Satan and his minions that really, really despise us want to destroy us, want to destroy our happiness, want to destroy our families, want to destroy our relationships, want to keep us far from God. Why cozy up to the bad guys? Thank you. <laughs> a little louder, Twee? Yeah, amen. amen, there you go. Uh, let's look, go on now in Luke chapter 8 from verse 40. Uh, Jesus raises a dead girl and heals a sick woman. Now, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him. So this is a predominantly Jewish crowd. <clears throat> they were all expecting him, and he's really stirred up quite a commotion by now. Then a man named Jairus, who was a synagogue leader, remember a synagogue is kind of like a Jewish church, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl about 12, was dying. Uh, and you know, that little sweetie, I got a, a daughter is 17, 15, and 13. And I can't even imagine what this father was going through, her poor parents. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. He's being mobbed by all these people. And I always laugh. I've laughed out loud at this before. And a woman who was uh, there had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. That's not the funny part. It's really not the funny part. Uh, I, yeah. But no one could heal, heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? When they all denied it, everybody wrote, no, not me. He's being crushed, and everybody's denying they touched him, you know. Get in the presence of God and then lie. Uh, Peter said, I wonder if he's like, has a headache. He said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing around you. Why, why are you asking who bumped into you? But Jesus said, someone touch me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, you know the feeling, right? <laughs> the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, she wanted to hide. She wanted to just get out of there. Came and she's trembling and she fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told him why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed and she knew it. Then he said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Daughter, I love Jesus' heart here. He's a young man. He may have been older than her. I don't know, but he's God. This is his daughter. He loves it when his sons and daughters come to him. And Jesus came to bring us peace. God wants to bring you peace in your war with him. Our orneriness, our feistiness, all the grudges we hold on, all the hatred we want to we relish, the grudges we nurse, God says, why don't we put all that away? Why don't we live for peace? Why don't you come to me? I'll forgive you completely. See, we can't offer peace to God because we're the ones who wronged him. He's the one who died for us so he can offer us peace. And he gives her, he says, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter has died. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus went to Jairus and he said, Don't be afraid. Just believe she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except for Peter, John, James, and the child's father and mother. Isn't that nice? Mom and dad went in with them. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. It's so tragic. The worst thing in the world when a, when a, when a child dies before their parents stop wailing, Jesus said, she's not dead but asleep. And they laughed derisively. They laughed at him knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, my child, second time he says, that's so tender. My child, get up. Her spirit returned. At once she stood up. 
And then I love Jesus. This is so beautiful. And this is not like a story somebody makes up. Jesus told them, go to get her something to eat. She's been dead. <laughs> it takes a lot out of you. <laughs> this is so beautiful and so wonderful. My daughter, your faith has healed you to the woman who had been bleeding. This gal who's been dead, my daughter, my child, get up. And he stood up and Jesus thinks about her physical needs, a God who also thinks about our physical needs. It's just like Jesus when he was resurrected. Remember the resurrected Jesus? The disciples don't know what to do with their life. They're, they're lost, so they're out fishing. And they see Jesus on the shore, and he's broiling, he's cooking fish. Come on, guys, let's have some fish. Isn't that beautiful? Our God loves us so much, he cares even about our physical needs. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what would have happened yet. It wasn't his time. He was on his schedule according to his time. He was going to die for our sins. Again, we see the incredible kindness of God. Incredible kindness, incredible kindness, incredible kindness. The, the woman, uh, when she touched the fringe of his cloak, in, in, in Hebrew it's two words. It meant corner and fringe, so corner fringe. In Greek it's just one word called a kraspadon, which is easy for us to remember because it kind of like grasping. Well, maybe not kraspadon, but I thought of grasping. And, and the neat thing is, is and, and I've heard this before, but you know, you hear stuff and you forget it. The Jews at that time would wear a white shawl with blue thread in it, and this, this uh, tassel, this uh, fringe of the cloth, would also be blue. And it's a color blue that the Jews stopped making shortly after Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. And it wasn't made again until recent human history. And we see the same color, white and blue, on the flag of Israel today. And so Jesus was wearing this shawl, which was the same color, white and blue, of the flag of Israel, and it marked Jesus as a faithful practicing Jew. And I, I was talking to somebody this week who was surprised to, to think of Jesus Christ as a Jew. I know somebody uh, once left our church because I think I said, my God is a Jewish carpenter or something, and didn't like, that was one of the reasons. But uh, Jesus wasn't rejecting the Old Testament. Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament, and that's why we don't have to abide by the Old Testament rules and regulations, because it found its fullness in him, not its rejection. Jesus did not reject the Old Testament. He fulfilled the law. Uh, Numbers 15, 37 through 41, and so Jesus was uh, obedient to, to, to the law. The, the Lord also spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and tell them that they shall make for themselves tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations, and they will, shall not put on the tassels of each corner, and they shall put on the, uh, on the tassel of, of each corner a cord of blue, and it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord. So you see this tassel on, on the shawl, and you will remember all that the Lord has done for you. So uh, as to do them and not follow after to all the Lord's laws, so you do them and not follow after your own heart, but follow after your own eyes, which have uh, caused you to play the harlot. So we just follow our own heart. Pretty soon we're rebelling against God. We're running away from God. So that you may remember to do all my commandments and to be holy before your God. I am the Lord your God. And remember, I brought you guys out of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. God's saying, remember, remember who's God, uh, who calls the shots, and it will help you here. Uh, there's also maybe a connection with the uh, book of Malachi, the first Italian prophet, uh, Malachi uh, 4.2. And he's talking about the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness rising with healing in its wings. And the idea here of that tassel is also similar to the word wings. And so this woman may have been aware of that there's healing, and maybe that's why she went for the tassel. Uh, either way, I don't know. <clears throat> the woman uh, knew that she had to get close to Jesus, and she was right. So we have pain, we have suffering, we have difficulty. Do what the woman did, run to Jesus, get close to Jesus, so close you can feel his breath on your face. Uh, remember, we want to be covered in the, death of, uh, in the dust of our rabbi because we walk so close behind him. Uh, touch Christ. Uh, be in communion in community with Christ. Have Christ in our lives. Uh, don't be like the demons who say, get away from me, I can't stand to be near you, and we want to run from God. Uh, Bob, you're very fond of saying this. Uh, when, we, when we have trouble in our lives, our temptation is to run from God, but instead we should run 
to God. Amen. And that, that needs to be our instinctual reaction because life does beat us up. And it does get hard. And we want to make sure that we're running to the grace and not we're running away from the grace because life's going to be hard either way. And either life is hard and you've got no grace or life is difficult, but you've got Jesus right there with you. I'd rather do it with God. See, God's answer to the problem of evil is not to explain things to us in a way that with our finite minds we can grasp every domino, every, every le lever that gets flipped, every switch. God's answer instead is Jesus. Jesus is the answer, yes, I do care. I care so much, I would die for you. God shows us his love. God doesn't answer it like a mathematical equation. God shows us. He shows us his goodness to the extent that he is born as one of us. We don't have a God who doesn't understand what it's like. He understands what it's like. He was born as one of us. He lives life with us. He suffered for us. He died in agony for us. And then he says, I know you can't understand everything now, but trust me, I'm good. I love you. And everything will be all right. And I'm now, I'm going to ask you to live a life of goodness and compassion for the sake of others, a life of loving me and of loving others because it's the best kind of life to live. Help others find their way home to me. And that's, that's the Great Commission, the Great Commandment and the Great Commission all together. The things that afflict, uh, and, and think about this again, that moment when we enter into paradise, the moment we breathe in the fresh air of heaven, the things that afflict us, afflict us most here on earth will only heighten our joy in heaven. The things that trouble us the most here will only cause us to love and rejoice and to enjoy heaven all the more. The man who's always been hungry without regular meals, pain of hunger, will rejoice even more than the rest of us when he feasts in paradise. I don't know if you guys remember, I, I lost, I don't know, 60, 70 pounds a few years back. And I'm too heavy now, but I never put on all that weight, which I'm glad of. But I was on this crazy diet, which apparently gave me the nutrients I needed, but not much else. And that food, this is, it was weird to me. Food never tasted that good to me in my life. It hasn't tasted that good to me since. I love food. I'm a person who loves food. But when you only got to eat one real meal a day and some bars the rest of the day, that one real meal, and it was small, every olive, you wouldn't believe the flavor in an olive. It, just a few pieces of meat, you wouldn't believe. The salad, everything just, what young people say it was popping, right? The food was so good. Well, a person who's been starving and starving and have known hunger, and hunger's been their companion their entire life, you know, you and I are going to enjoy the marriage feast of the Lamb. We're going to enjoy it, but not the way he will. We won't. The mother who lost her children in childbirth or while they're still young, she's going to enjoy their company in eternity. Imagine someone lame from birth or a soldier who's lost his legs, who wakes up in eternity and he runs across the green fields of heaven and he can jump and he can dance before the Lord. You know, you're going to enjoy running and jumping and dancing, <coughs> but not like him. Whatever's most difficult here is only going to increase our rapture in heaven in, in the new creation. I'm not, I'm not drawing a distinction between those two right now. Uh, think about a blind woman who finally sees the face of her husband her loved ones, color. Have you ever thought about how eyesight is so weird? I can see a blue car, a black car, a gray car, a red car. <clears throat> we can gain knowledge. There's a green car. We can gain knowledge about things that we're not touching. From a distance, light goes over there, bounces back over here. I don't know. And, and we're seeing intricate detail. I, how can we see so much? <clears throat> Imagine having knowledge of things that you're not touching for the first time. Imagine what if having her eyesight restored in paradise would be like for that woman. The dancer who had to stop dancing because of arthritis or old age. Imagine a person weighed down by guilt or struggling with depression their whole life, and they know they should be happy. They know God is good, but there's just something that's always heavy and always pulling them down. It doesn't even make sense all the time, but it's there. 
<clears throat> or somebody who's just bitter and they don't like life and it's difficult and, they're, they, and this person did something to them and everybody else gets to go on and, and laugh and, and have fun and this person hurt them so bad it feels like their whole life is ruined. Imagine all your life being held captive. It's like you're in a cell because you're always worried. You're always afraid. Something always, and now you're set free. You're free. No more depression, no more guilt, no more bitterness, no more worries, no more fears. If you've never struggled with depression, you're not going to know what it's like not to be depressed compared to that person. <clears throat> How about a narcissistic woman who suddenly is able to put down her mirror and is thrilled that she doesn't need to be worshipped she doesn't need to be the center of attention because God is so big. He's so good and is so much bigger than her. For the first time, she escapes from the trap of herself. Imagine a man who's been filled with lust and greed and selfishness in all his life and knowing that there's sins and always struggling against the darkness within him. And in a moment, he's set free and he looks around him and those things are no longer holding him down thrilled that he can enjoy seeing others being happy. It's not all about his happiness. He can enjoy acknowledging that everything belongs to God. He doesn't feel the need to claim it all for himself, free from selfishness. How about the person who is mathematically challenged? Will they wake up in heaven and find out that math comes easy for them? Or will they find that there is no math in heaven, just hell? <clears throat> no, you, well, you know what? I actually don't believe that. In fact, I believe that, honestly, math is one of the languages of heaven because it's a constant no matter what culture you're in, and it's a constant no matter where in the universe you go. Math is always there. The universe was created on math. Math is part of a heavenly language. So I think instead I'm going to finally get some things that I don't get now. Uh, <clears throat> think about the, the person who's... who's uh, who's physically marred, maybe because of the pain inside, but maybe because of a stroke or, <clears throat> or a fire or something, a car accident, but the person who, who, who is, who's made to be the person they were always meant to be and the, the wounds of this world are, are washed away, uh, sadness washed away, the sad person having their tears wiped away by Christ himself, the angry man <laughs> with a laugh of joy said, I'm not angry anymore. Or the philosopher, the philosopher who with a bemused expression realizes, yeah, the problem of evil, yeah, that wasn't really an issue <laughs> because Jesus, because Jesus loves you, because Jesus cared, because Jesus came to earth to save us, and all we have to do is reach out to him and find salvation, find forgiveness, and find acceptance. Because Jesus. Jesus is the answer. He's much more than just a really nice math teacher, biology teacher, English teacher. Jesus Christ is the answer to the question, does God care? Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord God, please set us free from all the things that hold us down. Lord, we want to dance before you. We want to run to you. All these things drag us down. They hold us back. Lord, we want to live our lives for you. Lord, please make us bold witnesses. Help us be like the man who is uh, freed of the demonic influence, Lord, who went everywhere in his town telling everybody what you had done for them. Lord, God, please let me be that person who tells everyone what you've set me free from, Lord, how you've changed me, what you've done in my life. Lord, God, you are good, and I want to be with you. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.